got all the buttons pushed, I think we're ready to go. Good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to see everybody here today. It's uh, we got a holiday weekend uh, on us, uh, Memorial Day uh, tomorrow, so I hope that you've got some great things planned. Uh, and as you're doing those family things with uh, friends and and wherever we be doing fire up barbecues, be thinking about those uh, freedoms that we have and why we have those, especially when it comes to the freedom that we have in Christ. Uh, we're going to continue our Growing in Faith series by looking at the uh, pattern of justification by faith, the historical pattern that is given to us through Abraham's example. So, I hope you have your Bibles with you. Be turning to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. What we want to do today is to understand Paul's use of Abraham as both an historical proof and a pattern of his doctrine of justification by faith apart from the deeds of the law. And there's three areas that we're going to look at uh, specifically here. But Anyway, these three uh, areas that we're going to look at will show us the way that Abraham was not justified. We're going to see that Abraham's example serves as the example of justification by faith to all. Not just the uh, Gentile, but also the Jew, which follows uh, real well on our study of the last chapter, chapter 3. Uh, secondly, we're going to see that, uh, I mean, thirdly, the demonstration of Abraham's faith will be depicted. And then fourthly, we're going to know the reason all of this about Abraham was written down. So let's look specifically at some uh, things that we're going to see here. We need to remember that Paul has spoken to the Galatians, okay? you remember our last series through that letter. Uh, Paul had stated that uh, they were not to resort to the Old Covenant for purposes of salvation, that they would in fact lose that salvation. And I would remind us again that those who teach once saved by all, uh, once saved, uh, 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 all, once saved, always saved, if they teach that particular doctrine, they can't look at the Galatian letter and continue with that uh, that tenet because it's just it's just not there. So Paul plainly states that taking part in any aspect of the old covenant will cause them to be severed from Christ. Galatians chapter five, those first few verses there uh, uh, point that out. So this is basically the same concern that he's now addressing to his Roman audience. What Paul does here is to show the practical side of Abraham's situation to prove his point. Paul presents the experience of Abraham perhaps for two reasons. One, to offer historical proof of that doctrine of justification by faith. Now, this is the righteousness of God without the law which he said had been witnessed to by the law and prophets. And this was seen in, uh, let me go over here, Romans chapter 3, uh, verse 21. He says here, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And then secondly, another reason why Paul might be presenting this particular uh, lesson here is to present a historical pattern of justification by faith apart from the deeds of the law, which, of course, we need to imitate. Um, chapter 4, let me read verses 11 and 12. It says here, He received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be reckoned to them, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of circumcision, but also who follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. 
circumcised. And then look at verses 23, 24, and 25. It says here, Now not for his sake only was it written that it was reckoned to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be reckoned as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered up because of our transgressions and was raised because of uh, of our justification. So there's there's kind of a, the direction that we're going to go today. So to begin with, we're going to look at the first of three ways in which Abraham was not justified. All right. This may be, uh, this first one here may be illustrated in the act of the paralytic's friends in Mark chapter two. Um, if if you remember that, do you remember that story? You know Jesus is teaching in a house, and and the house is packed with people. You could say it's pretty much standing room only, and there's people at the door. And this individual, he was paralyzed. He's he's on a pallet. You know, he's on a bed. He's kind of it's kind of like one of those uh, a soft stretcher. As it were, you know, if you, uh, Sherry and I uh, like the series MASH, you know, and they'll have those soft stretchers for the soldiers. And so they would carry them from point A to point B. And, and, and this fellow was carried by four of his friends. So, it, so they each have a corner of his bed. And I, I would imagine it doesn't have those, those wooden bars, you know, like the soft stretchers, uh, that were used in the the mash series, or you know, by those by the soldiers on the battlefield, and so they're just grabbing. They each grab a corner of this to carry him. Well, they can't get him through the door. So what do they do? They haul him up to the roof and they start taking apart the roof, and they're going to lower him down in there. So what does Jesus say about that? He says, seeing their faith. Now, it wasn't the work that Jesus was specifically looking at. Jesus was looking at the reason why they were tearing apart that roof. Because they knew that Jesus would be able to provide something to them. For them to get to that, they needed to do some things. It was their faith that caused them to move. And so that's very similar to what we find in Abraham's life. What, look at the first three verses of chapter 4. He says here, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And Abraham believed God. He believed God. And then, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. What would be true if Abraham had been justified by works? If you remember from Galatians chapter 3, uh, it, it starts out, I mean, uh, Galatians chapter 6, uh, Paul told them, but even if, even if one of you, I'm sorry, I'm going to misquote that, and I don't want to do that. And honestly, I have to be able to quote that. I'm not going to pass my course. Brethren, if any man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritually store of such a one in a spirit of gentleness, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now notice what he says in verse 3. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And so that's why Paul says what he does to the Romans here in, in uh, verse 3 here. <clears throat> he's for, I mean, verse 2. He's not going to have anything to boast about before God. We do a lot of good things. We do some great things. We do some things... Uh, I heard this morning, I thought this is a pretty neat way to describe 
what we can see good being done in something else. Cooler than a fan. I'm not going to soon forget that one. Um, that's a pretty neat way to describe the things that people do which can be honorable, okay? You know, but the thing is, <clears throat> not all of those things can we boast about before God. And we, we really do need to keep that uh, keep that in mind. Um, Paul refers to a an Old Testament passage here. There in, uh, in verse three, this comes from Genesis chapter fifteen, and we're going we're we're going to look at this in uh, in a in a in, in greater detail here in in a minute. But the reason I think Paul cites this particular passage is to show that we are justified by faith and not by law, not by the works. You know, there was a, there were things that the law required. And in Genesis chapter 17, Abraham is being given some of those things. But in Abraham's case, he was justified by faith prior to the law. What specific, specific event can, uh, can we look at which tells us about Abraham's faith? Remember when he was told to sacrifice his son? Abraham never questioned that. Why did he not question that? Because I believe that scripture teaches there always Abraham had in the back of his mind that God was going to do something different. And so he, without question, he went all the way through that. He took Isaac, he took the wood for the fire, them both to a place of sacrifice. Abraham got to the point where he had tied up his son, laid him out on the altar, and as that picture showed, which, de which describes our text uh, really well, he had that knife up in the air ready to slay his son, and God stopped him. Why did God stop him? Because God recognized his faith. That's, that's important for us. But it's, it's, again, it's not our works. It is our faith which justifies us. <clears throat> we also need to understand that Abraham's justification did not come by ritual. Was it by works? Nor was it by ritual. Look at verses 9 through uh, 9 and 10 in Romans 4. He says, Is this blessing then upon the circumcised or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. He quotes that same passage that he earlier quoted. How then was it reckoned? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Why is Paul pushing this idea of circumcision? He did the same thing in the Galatian letter. That's the, that was one of those things which the Judaizers wanted to, wanted to stress. They wanted to push this. You have to do this if you're going to be saved. It was a ritual that, that they were involved in and had been involved in for thousands of years. And in their mind, it was supposed to be something that continued. Look, look here in our Old Testament here. Let's go to Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, we're going to look at uh, the first six verses. Notice what he teaches here. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. Not Abraham, yet God changes his name later. Came to Abram, Abram in a vision. Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, O Lord God, 
What will you give me since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside. Now look toward the heavens and count the stars. If you're able to count them, and he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then Abram believed in the Lord, and God reckoned to him, reckoned it to him as righteousness. Abram is, he is getting up there in years at this point. God promised him that he would have his own child. He'd be the father of many nations. And we know that happened. Uh, let's let's count the ways. Okay, he became the father of the Arabs through Ishmael. He he became the father of the Jews through Isaac. He became the father of many other nations uh, through. It was another bride. Um, I don't have the example for me. But then ultimately, he became the father of. Many, 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 many more because of the seed line of Christ. Notice what we're told at the end of uh, Galatians chapter, is it Galatians? Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 20, I believe it's 26. <clears throat> um, he says, all of you are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Why? For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. He goes on to say there's neither Jew nor Greek, so it's got nothing to do with nationality. He says there's neither slave nor free. It has nothing to do with class position. He, uh, he says uh, it has nothing to do with male nor female, so regardless of your gender, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, in verse 29, this is what he says. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Heirs according to the promise. Through Christ and the others mentioned, the promise God gave to Abram was fulfilled. It was fulfilled. Um, look at uh, Genesis chapter 17. So, so God gives him a promise there. In Genesis chapter 15, uh, he is told about that nation, that seed promise, basically. But in Galatians, and we have to point out that in, in 15, verse 6, it says there that his faith was reckoned as righteousness. Now, two chapters later, this is what we find in Genesis chapter 17. Um, he says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. And that's verse 7. In verse 10, he says, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. So we find then that Abraham was counted justified, right? He was found Righteous, right? By faith, two chapters earlier. And so we find that it's not by ritual that we are saved. Again, it is by faith. Um, <clears throat> there, are, there are numerous passages in Scripture which talk to us about the importance of faith over ritual. One of those is in 1 Samuel 15, 22, where Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed God's word, and to heed than the fat of rams. Proverbs 21, 3, it says, To do righteousness and justice is, is desired by the Lord rather than sacrifice. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools.
for they do not know that they're doing evil. People that offer ritual, whatever ritual that may be to God, and I'm talking about those of us, and I, I, I think it's important for us to know, it's easy for us to apply this to false religions, to Christians who are worshiping in error, to those who would rather offer rituals rather than to listen to the truth of the New Testament. But we in the church can fall prey to this too if we look at baptism more than a ritual rather than an aspect of salvation, which it is. We, we can fall prey to this if we apply an importance of attending a worship service rather than listening to the messages and being an encouragement or accepting encouragement within that service. You see what I'm saying? And so it's very important for us to under, understand that as well. Isaiah chapter, uh, I want to say chapter 1. Chapter 1, beginning in verse 11, Isaiah says, What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings and lambs and the fat of fed cattle. And I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and a solemn assembly. I hate you. And notice, when, when God is admonishing them here, he makes note of the fact of their attitude, which on the surface is right. It's important. It is a solemn assembly when we gather together before God. But, but hidden behind this, God continues... I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered in blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, Defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. There's a phrase that uh, it'll go around the internet from time to time, but it says, no God, no peace. And that is N-O. No God, no God. And he says, no peace. But then the next phrase is, no God, no peace. K-N-O-W. If you know God, you're going to know peace. And that's kind of what Isaiah is putting forth right here. Hosea says, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And, and we're told in Micah chapter 6, basically uh, uh, something very uh, similar to that. In Micah chapter 6, beginning in verse 6, what, With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. Verse 8, the prophet says, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? That's, that's, a, really, that's a really good passage to help us understand the expectations of God. Jesus himself said it in the, in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. We're also told what uh, in John 13, 
in 33 and 34, he says, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. If you have love for one another, then they will know that you're my disciples. That's how we delineate ourselves from the world. And boy, I'm telling you, in this day and age, that's absolutely needed. I'm going to get on a soapbox for just briefs. We've had a shooting in Texas last week, which was absolutely horrible. We had a feller in California uh, drive his car up on the sidewalk and hit some kids. Um, and, and people want to know. They ask the question, why? Why, why is this going on? And we can, ex we can tell you exactly why. You get rid of God, and this is the exact result. If you don't want God, then quit whining about what you see. It's your own fault. Absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> you know, there, the purpose and example of Abraham's circumcision, you know, is... Uh, it is, is seen for us in, in our text. The purpose was to illustrate a covenant, a pact that God had made uh, with the people here. I need to interject something here too, because there have been some that said, you know, that it's uh, it's a good that is a good argument to point out why circumcision is not required today. Because in, as we read in the Galatian letter study that we're talking about right now. They're saying that it's really not a good argument because women can't partake of circ circumcision. Obviously, this is physically true. But I will say that is that it's not a good argument because women are personally involved in this. And we have an exact, uh, uh, we have a perfect example of that between Moses and Zipporah. God was not happy <coughs> with Moses. And, and, and we can read about this in um I wrote down. Yes, in Exodus chapter 4. And so, because Moses and Zipporah, they had two children, only one of whom had been circumcised up to that point. I do not believe that it is without the without understanding that maybe. Because, because the second child had not been circumcised, it was very impactful upon Zipporah. Culturally speaking, this was not something that she was familiar with. It was not something that they practiced. And, and she saw it as, she saw the pain that her child went through. What mother wants to see their child go through any kind of pain? Certainly not any sane, loving mother, right? And so when their second boy is circumcised, what does she do? She angrily says to her, to her husband, Moses, you are a blood, uh, bridegroom of blood to me. I think that women, mothers, are... Uh, impacted by this ritual. And so the reason that it's not to be practiced today is because it really has nothing to do with salvation at all. Paul said that to the Galatians and he's now saying that to the Romans. Let's look at our next slide here. So it's not by works, it's not by ritual, and it can't be by law either. So the promise to Abraham and his seed, it was realized through faith. Let's, look, let's begin in Romans uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be the heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. This is a good hint for us as to why the law was given. The law was given to help people realize the sinfulness of sin. That's why we have that old covenant. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that. Right? 
And when we disobey God, we sin. We fall under the penalty of sin, which the Roman letter has said is death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And we need to be clear, we've already seen, 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we all need justification. How do we get that? That's why we're having this discussion in chapter 4. Abraham's justification is not by law, but by, but by faith. And so he, it is realized here. In the beginning, uh, let's, let's finish reading verse 16. For this reason it's by faith that it might be in accordance with grace in order that the promise may be certain to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. So he's talking about two different groups of people. The Jews who had been living under, under law, but then when he talks about the faith of Abraham, he is pointing directly to the Gentiles because they were not under the law. They had the faith of or they had the faith of Abraham expressing that faith in God, in Christ, in the Spirit before any indication of the law was given. Just like Abraham. Verse 17, as it is written, the father of many nations have I made you in the sight of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. And so the, the kind of faith demonstrated by Abraham is seen in, the, uh, in verses 17 through 22. It is the same kind of faith that we need to pattern. And there's five things here that I want us to see. First of all, there is the reckoning of his faith. Verse 17, he believed God. That's the reckoning of faith. Secondly, from verse 18, there is the basis of his faith. That which had been spoken, so your descendants shall be. Okay? It's, it, it is a reflection upon uh, uh, the basis of God's word. God said this. If God said it, uh, it's fact, um, and, and, and it can be believed. Okay? It comes from God. It's not coming from man. It's not coming from, you know, some so-called religious leaders. It's not coming from Muhammad. It's not coming from Confucius. You, you get my joke. It's from God. And so the basis of faith is God's word. What's Romans 10, 17 say? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by what? By what? The word of God. A respectful listening of truth, and that's exactly right. Thirdly, there was the, there is the consideration of his faith. This is from verses nineteen and twenty. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith giving glory to God. And so this, the, consider, the consideration of his faith has everything to do with reflecting upon the promise of God. How do we do that? What helps us to remain faithful? This, what we're about to do in a few minutes, one of the reasons why we have a communion on the first day of every week, just like the Christians did, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 7, is so that we can be focused once again on a promise and why that promise was given and how that promise is received. God promised us eternal life through the sacrifice of Christ. We have faith in that and we are reminded every first day of the week. Fourthly, the persuasion of his faith. Look at verse 21. Being fully assured that what he, God, had promised, God was able also to perform. God's power. Why do we have a Lord's Supper? We cannot have a Lord's Supper apart from the resurrection of Christ. If he can be raised from the dead, so too can we, right? That's what we will read about in Romans chapter 6, those first few verses there. That's right. 
we too can be raised from the dead. And that's just, that's just a nice promise to know that we don't have to suffer eternally now. The fifth one is the effect of his faith. Look at verse 22. Therefore also it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And that's the effect. When we, when we trust God, when we have faith in God, when we hear his promises and believe his promises, we too can be justified by that faith. Amen? That is, it is it's, it's a great, it is a great thing. You know, it is well seen in the example of Abraham that we can only be saved by faith and not by works. I don't want us to get the idea that faith alone, because folks, that phrase can't be found in Scripture. By faith alone. Okay? We need to understand that. And so the faith that we express, it is a responsive faith. It's no different from when uh, Abraham took Isaac to be sacrificed. That situation, what Abraham was doing with his son, was a response in faith. And so we, res we need to respond in faith as well. Are we going to believe the things we heard? That belief is a response. Are we going to, as a result of that belief, confess Christ as our Lord? If we confess Christ as our Lord, that is a response of believing the things that he said. Christ can be my Lord. Christ created the world. Christ holds the world together. We find that in the Colossian letter. Christ saved me from my sin. We find that all throughout Scripture. We can, we can believe that because that's the response. We repent from our sin. If we're going to call him Lord, that means he directs my moral decisions, right? And then we are immersed into Christ because it is in that act where, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, our sins are washed away as though never having been there. What did we read in Isaiah? You shall be whiter than snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, you shall be whiter than snow. That's what happens by faith when we are baptized. We simply cannot gain eternal life through earning it, through ceremony, nor by following some devised set of rules. Trust in God, trust in God's sacrifice through His Son, and we will be cleansed from our sin and wrong. Amen? Amen. Amen? The lesson is yours today. If anybody has any need, won't you come forward while we stand and sing? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can they?